First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for this invitation to come and meet with you and to share a few ideas. Uh, as Brother Mkholisi has said, uh, I did point out that I have no prophetic gifts. I, I write books because I tried to do something more useful and failed. Um, and since I've been trained to write, I do that as a defense against total despair. <laughs> And seeing people like you who are actively engaged in trying to salvage pieces of our wrecked lives uh, gives me some hope that, after all, we are not alone. It's a pleasure then to be here, to come and observe, and to the extent that it's possible to participate with you in the work that you're doing. I've been told that your focus today is on the theme of the awakening. I hope to contribute a little bit to your deliberations and I shall do so by concentrating on the work of an African intellectual who worked for our awakening. His name was Sheikh Antajop. Right. Now, if we are concerned with our awakening, it's because we've been asleep. Now, we were put to sleep by historical catastrophes and you know when people get into an accident they need to go to sleep in order to survive the accident mm. if you are totally conscious when it happens you won't survive so sleep is sometimes useful but after sleep we have to wake now, since these catastrophes began, our minds have been kept in a sleepy state of ignorance through a series of cultural and intellectual anesthetics. All right. Dope. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now, mm. sometimes the dope is called religion. Mm, okay. Islam, mm. Christianity, mm. Okay. and we go to it mm. looking for relief. Okay. I mean, people don't take dope because they are evil. They take it because they're suffering and they think that it will ease their suffering. Yes. Right. Say that, teach. Now, whatever the different names of the dope that we fill ourselves with, the effect is the same, to make us think we are nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, the awakening means for us that we need to regain knowledge of ourselves, mm -hmm. the something that we are. To do that, we have first of all to end our addiction to the poisons that put us to sleep. Secondly, we need to cultivate healing values that will help us remove, re remake ourselves and then remake the universe. Now, such work requires careful preparation aimed at analyzing and seeing through the false values directed against us. After that, we also need to identify the regenerative values and put them at the center of our own conversations, mm -hmm. our behavior, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and our institutions. Mm. You see, I'm not talking about speeches. Mm. I mean conversations because speeches are wonderful events, but mm. they're just events. They're not processes. Mm -hmm. They happen and then they can be forgotten. Mm. Conversations we always have every day and the things we do every day are more important than the fantastic things we do once in a while mm -hmm. and forget them. Behavior, because it is possible for us to know what is right to do and even to say it, to utter it. But if we cannot integrate it into our behavior, it is worse than useless because it serves only as a mask for the wrong things that we do. Mm. Now, somebody who does evil and doesn't know how to hide it is less dangerous than somebody who does evil but is smart enough and knows the words to cover all yes. of this. Institutions, because our behavior our words, everything we do right is ephemeral as long as it's not anchored in something lasting. Because yes. institutions help us maintain the good that we have and weed out the evil that uh, is bothering us. In other words, the meaning of our awakening is that we aspire to create a new way of life. But awakening is not a simple process. Mm. An awakening that is hasty or brutal mm. is bound to be incomplete. Mm. A deep, thorough, lasting awakening has to be well thought out, unhurried, slow and gentle, like good rain, mm. like mm. good lovemaking. Mm -hmm. Slow, gentle, well thought out. Now, there is a danger in incomplete, hurried awakenings because the body gets shaken, it's hustled into action while the mind is really still asleep. Mm. The result is sleepwalking, mm. physical action mm. without mental, intellectual, spiritual clarity. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of such action is predictable. Mm -hmm. It's a massacre of courageous but poorly prepared souls. Mm -hmm. A complete awakening, on the other hand, is well prepared. It's a process in which the body is not rushed into rising until the mind has woken, until the mind has taken stock of the situation, until the mind has planned the most effective routes to action and made room for contingencies mm. so that if a chosen route happens to be blocked, mm. alternative routes stay open. Because motion is important, but it is the path followed that gives motion its meaning. Mm -hmm. And mm. the path is important, but it's the goal that gives the path its meaning. Mm. Now, there is a form of incomplete awakening which looks complete on the surface. It is blindness masquerading as sight. Mm. Now, when we waken, we have healthy bodies inhabited by thinking minds. Mm -hmm. Now, when many such people with able bodies and thinking minds are united by a shared goal, mm -hmm. consciously chosen, and embraced. Mm -hmm. The resulting interaction is powerful, purposeful, and loving. Now, that interaction of minds moving towards a shared goal is the closest thing I know to religious power. Sometimes, though, able bodies can be directed not by thinking minds of their own, but by a believing heart, which in its blind generosity, in its confused trust, allows the body to follow someone else's thinking mind. Mm -hmm. Now, when that happens, we get a community 
made up of a leader and a crowd of followers. Mm -hmm. Such a community can often look awake. Sometimes it can look dynamically, excitingly, sensationally alive. Mm -hmm. In reality, though, it is still sleepwalking. (laughs) Because the awakened soul does not need to follow a leader. Mm -hmm. And the awakened guide does not need to be followed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awakened souls are companions working together, moving together towards a common chosen goal. Mm -hmm. Now, we think leaders are important because they have knowledge and experience of the paths we all need to travel on. If they do their work well, they will have no followers left. There will only be friends to work with in mutual respect. Now, to awaken souls, experienced guides share their knowledge, which brings them to the same level as their followers. Now, When each soul in the community knows the way home, the entire community advances along the way together, and it has a great deal more energy than if it was following a seeing-eye dog called a leader. Now, the problem with a community made up of followers and a leader Mm -hmm. is that once the leader goes the community becomes acephalic it has no head it just wanders around it's a pitiful sight Uh, what is needed is a community where the leadership runs throughout the entire body. Now, for too many centuries, Africans in our sleep have formed communities dependent on leaders. We have had heroes, leaders, saviors. They've been wonderful people, and we've been right to love them. But what happens when they go? our problems remain. It's therefore time to change the structures of our communities so they don't depend so fatally on leaders. Mm -hmm. So that they can have such good leaders that they abolish themselves. (laughs) Time to find ways to open all eyes in the community Mm -hmm. Time to find methods for sharing knowledge of goals and paths with all in the community. One of the terrible weaknesses of Africa has been the hoarding of power, Mm -hmm. the keeping of knowledge as secrets. Now, some of the keepers have done it because they saw knowledge as sources of power and in that they were right. Mm -hmm. But in using it as sources of power for themselves and their families instead of for the whole community, Mm -hmm. they were wrong and we are paying for the Mm -hmm. problems they caused. Mm -hmm. The recent history of Africa is full of leaders who failed to create thinking, self-sustaining communities. Some failed because they didn't have enough time. They were killed. Mm. Some failed for lack of opportunity. Mm -hmm. But some also failed because they didn't have any real desire to empower the powerless. Mm. Because they saw in the powerlessness of those who raised them to power a source, and they were afraid that if they empowered the powerless, there would be nobody beneath them bearing them up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
At any rate, these leaders had tremendous work thrust on them. They were too busy to address certain fundamental questions regarding our awakening. That is why, although we have had such wonderful leaders, many of us are still asleep. But we've also had thinkers who did address these questions. One of them was Sheikh Antadjop. I went to Senegal ten years ago uh, because I wanted to find out more, not about him, but about his work and the background to it. I tried to get to see him. Uh, I knew a friend of his, Osman Semben, who is my elder brother, a writer. Uh, he took me to Sheikh and Job's house several times. We did not meet him because he happened to be out for one reason or the other. So I would say, well, it wasn't in the cards that we were to meet. Uh, but I would like it understood that I think whatever he tried to do, it would be an honor for people like me to continue that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the questions he addressed were the following. Who, in fact, are we? Mm -hmm. What is our situation? Mm -hmm. What is our real history? What do our present prospects look like? And what are the resources, the natural and material resources, the intellectual and spiritual resources we can use. How can we reclaim these resources, then use them to improve our future prospects? Now, Sheikh Antajab spent his life working to find answers, and the fruit of his research is contained in the work uh, that he left behind. Uh, I have been following that work for oh so many years now, and it saddens me that he's got so much work which is not known in the English-speaking part of the world, mm -hmm. because he wrote in French. Mm -hmm. When I arrived in Senegal, I contacted the university and I told them that I was capable of translating all Sheikh Antajab's books, uh, because I've been trained to do that work. Um, they said no. Mm. So. What is available in English uh, is usually bits and pieces from one book together with something else from another and so forth. Now, uh, that is okay, but a better way to make his work available would be to translate all of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there are people willing to do that, that work. Uh, there will not be time to go into details about what is contained here. I shall try and make an outline. It will be inadequate, but if there is an opportunity to go deeper into the content of this work, uh, I hope we can take it one day. To the question, who are we? Uh, Sheikh Antajab answered, we are Africans. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems uh, like an obvious answer, mm -hmm. but I remember uh, there was a time when if you said uh, to some people, uh, I think you are an African. Uh -huh. oh, so now, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sometimes uh, these losses of identity can be funny. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, I met 
an African-American called Sinclair Drake. He came to Ghana, and uh, there was some reason for me to meet him, so I went to meet him. And he told me a story that he'd just been to the Congo, and uh, he was in a hotel, and an African waiter came to him and said, where are you from, sir? And uh, Sinclair Drake said, uh, I'm from America. He said, ah, you must be an American Negro. I've never met a Negro. You know? <laughs> now, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have not always known ourselves mm -hmm. uh, as Africans. Mm -hmm. And to this day, if you go to the continent of Africa and you meet somebody uh, and ask him, who are you? They're not likely to tell you, I'm an African. They will say, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a Ghanaian, I'm a Tanzanian, I'm a Mozambican, you know, anything but Mm -hmm. I'm an African. Mm -hmm. They don't know mm -hmm. what it means to say I'm a Nigerian. What was Nigeria before white people met in right. Berlin right. to decide that whoever could draw lines right. along mm -hmm. the territory and put guns to defend yeah. those Steve, areas Steve, Steve. owned the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so the identities that we have our fake identities. Mm. We have to remake our identities and the best identity we can have for now is the African identity, the continental identity. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, so. Now, what is our situation? Again, to, to that question, Sheikh Antijab would answer confusion, mm. division, mm multiplied by ignorance. Mm. Uh, but, you see, he did not say these things to condemn us. He mm. said them as a prelude to suggesting ways of ending our confusion, our ignorance. What is our history? He spent a lot of time answering the question. Because, uh, remember that there was a time not very long ago when the idea itself of Africans having a history uh, was considered unsound, yeah. academically wrong. Now, you could not defend that in any thesis. Now, uh, his answer was, not only do we have a history, but we are the root of humanity. We were there at the beginning. Uh, that is to say that all human beings are kin to us, whether right. they recognize that or not. If they hate us, that is their problem. Yeah. Yes. Those who do not hate us, those who would work with us, we can work with them no matter where they come from uh, to find ways of remaking a universe destroyed by too much greed and too much hate. He also said that we are at the root of civilization. This is another area from which we had been pushed. Now, we need to study seriously in order to understand what he was saying. He learned to read the records of ancient Egypt before he was able to assert, no, you people are lying. Mm -hmm. That, in effect, was what his thesis was saying. Mm -hmm. He was saying to his professors, mm -hmm. now, your, your traditions are lying. Yeah. This yeah. is the truth. Look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a courageous thing to say. But to the end of his life, he suffered for it. Mm. Now, it is not sufficient for us to just accept what Sheikh and Job did and say, it's done. Mm. Mm. We need to do the studying that will make us possess mm. these resources. Yeah. They are 
highly valuable intellectual resources. And you know, we should be teaching little children how to read and write hieroglyphic characters, ideograms, because the values are there. But we don't do it. We don't have any plans for doing it. We don't have the institutions for doing it. I've met plenty of people who know enough to take names from ancient Egypt. When I ask them, can you write? Mm. Say no. Mm. They are waking up, but they're sort of stretching. <laughs> you know, and enjoying just that early morning feeling of being awake again. Well, it's time to get up. Yeah, There's work yeah, to do. Yeah. You see. We need to work on the knowledge. You see, it's, you can have a certain kind of knowledge and it acts on you again like a drug. It soothes you and says, well, isn't it nice to know that we are descended from these fantastic people who invented this and that and that? No. Well, they did their work and they, they're gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They did their work so well, they left traces that people have tried to wipe out and they didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. It's not for us to use their work as mattresses to lie on. Mm -hmm. We ought to use their work as springboards. Mm -hmm. Get up and move. Mm -hmm. What are our prospects? Now, for centuries, we have been organized according to principles that are completely alien to us, principles of profit and advantage. The greatest African values are principles of justice, balance, reciprocity, uh, which the ancient Egyptians called ma'at. You will not find these principles at work in any of the great institutions of the modern world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The great institutions are the World Bank, the yeah. International Monetary Fund, right. and so forth. And all our political leaders are going to these people and saying, teach us what to do. Yeah. Well, hmm. all these banks and stuff can teach is destruction. Yeah. They can tell people cut down your forests, yeah. sell the wood cheap, mm -hmm. then you'll get some foreign exchange. With the foreign exchange, you can get some guns to defend your president against people who are hungry and who may get angry at Kanaka. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going along with this because we don't know our own values. Our values are opposed to this kind of stuff. The search for profit the search for advantage. Well, we are people who have suffered from this search for profit. People have come to Africa to buy people, human beings. There are certain resources that should never be sold if African values were on top of our existence. We would never sell land. No. We would never sell water. No. We wouldn't sell the air, yeah. the sun, yeah. <laughs> and we wouldn't sell human yeah. beings. Yeah. Yeah. But we did. Yeah. And in order to recover mm. our values, we have to go back and know what they are and find ways of affirming them against all the power of destroyers. Now, we shall not move out of our deprivation unless we recognize our resource bases and work out intelligent ways to reclaim them. This requires precise knowledge of what these resources are. In... Uh, in a little book that was 
I think translated into English. I, I have not read the English version, uh, but it's called Les Fondements Économiques et Culturels d'un État fédéral d'Afrique noire. The uh, economic and cultural bases, foundations of F, uh, a black African federal state. I think it's available in English translation. Sheikh and the Job laid out the resources we have if we look at the entire African continent. Because, you see, if you look at a country like the Gambia or, the, or Sierra Leone, if you cut it off from Africa and you try to see what resources do they have, you will come away thinking, well, these are poor people. Look at the whole continent and you see that poverty is just nonsense on such a continent. That's a continent three times the size of the United States with a lot of wealth, so much wealth that people come there to get the basis of their well-being. And it's been happening for centuries and the continent is still not exhausted. But we need to stop the spillage. We need to find ways to stop the spillage. And that starts with knowledge of ourselves and what our resource bases ought to be. Yeah. Spiritual resources. There was a time when people, African people, people of African descent, thought that we didn't have intellectual resource bases that if we wanted to think, we had to go and borrow from other people. Mm. We know better now. Yeah. We know better now, and it is time for us to get a hold of these resources. But for all that, we need to study. Unfortunately, we have been told that knowledge and study isn't our bag. Mm. Mm-hmm. We need to get out of that way of thinking because forward movement is not going to happen unless we recognize that there is a hierarchy of values that a human being according to Tahetet uh, is made up of a head a belly sexual organs, among other things. But if you want to stand up as a human being and work as a human being, you have to recognize that the head is higher than the belly Mm -hmm. and both are higher than the sex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is Tahetep who says, He who obeys his belly belongs to the enemy. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know of a a vow that healers make among my mother's people before they, they can become certified healers. They have to learn Uh, a number of things, including discipline. And one of the vows they they take is never to let their sexual organs rise higher than their heads. (laughs) It doesn't say don't let it rise. By by all means. (laughs) But not higher. Now, uh, it won't be enough then to find these values and it won't be enough to absorb them. We need to develop institutions of awareness to help maintain them, to help make them more permanent than they have been so Mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. Uh, Knowledge of our spiritual and material inheritance 
uh, to be given to our children from an early age. We don't, if you wait till somebody gets to the university before you teach them this, it's too late. The first day they come to school, they ought to be learning these things. In ancient Egypt, they began at four. Now, as far as institutions are concerned, uh, we all know that the schools available to us are full of holes. Uh, we want to build institutions. My suggestion is that we look at some old institutions, but not to take them like that, because they too were full of holes. Uh, there was a wonderful institution in ancient Egypt, in Kemet. It was called the Per Ankh. Uh, per means a house. Ankh, life. It was the house of life. That is where kids were taken from the age of four. And they could stay there and study. The first thing they was taught was knowledge of their ancestors. That's why it was called the house of life. Mm -hmm. The ancestors were dead, but their memory was kept alive in the house of life. Right. Now, these were schools where the kids were taught and they ate there. There were adults whose job it was to look after them. There was not this business of, this is my child and therefore I give that child quality time. Quality time belonged to all the children of the community. And if adults were available, well, that was all to the good. We need to create modern versions of the oldest of African schools, the Per Ankh. Thank you.